This is about my observations from a recent business trip I had to take, and it deals with flying. Now, I used to be one of those uh, elite frequent flyers. Happy to say I left that club. I actually found a life. I really have great empathy for those who have to fly uh, because of their job. It's not all the glamour it uh, once was. So, uh, if you have uh, ever uh, flown, chances are you've been on a 737. It's the workhorse of the industry, been around for decades, starting with the 200 mile uh, model and now up with the uh, 900 series. Uh, or you've been on the Airbus 320 or 319. I think they now have the 321. Again, uh, these are midsize uh, jets, um, ideal for what they call short hauls. So I prefer a window seat. That's just the way it is. I have found that if I can get the window seat, and usually I do because I get to fly at the front of the plane, um, that's the best spot. It, it, it affords you just a little bit of privacy, <laughs> although that's an illusion. So I prefer to sit there. I've never seen actually a postum note comes flying by and gets stuck to the window. Don't know how that happens. Anyway, uh, in all the many, many years that I have flown, never had an incident where there was ever an issue with the engines. Until recently, it seems like the reliability of the overall engines uh, for most aircrafts are outstanding. However, here recently, it seems like there have been more and more reported incidences of engines, how shall we say, having catastrophic failure, <laughs> like disintegrating. Incidents are increasing all over the world, it's, and it's not to any one particular uh, make of aircraft or manufacturer. We all know about the Southwest uh, incident. Uh, that report hasn't come out from the NTSB, but when it does, I'm sure it's probably going to show that metal fatigue was a contributing factor, if not the contributing factor. Again, we're seeing incidences of metal fatigue in these engines, which the metal uh, is tungsten, and I believe there's probably titanium in there. I mean, who knows what other composites they may even have. But these engines are thoroughly tested and vetted out. They're not supposed to do this. And come to find out, it's not just the engine, folks. Remember that window seat I have that I like? Well, <laughs> these days that might not be the most ideal spot to be in, it would seem. There have been complete, what we would call catastrophic structural uh, breaches in aircrafts. And folks, this is not Photoshop. This actually happens, and it happens with more and more frequencies. I mean, want to talk about a seat that has a view? Oh, yeah. And how about this? How would you like to know that the tail section, which by the way, you got no tail, you no fly. Uh, that would be catastrophic. And yet, they're finding what they call micro stress fractures. This one was not a micro. This one was a big one. And you got to ask yourself, at least I do, is, well, what could be causing all of these rash of, well, catastrophic failures? I mean, it's, it's amazing, number one, that uh, there has only been one incident of a person actually losing their life. So I'm sitting here because I got nowhere to go, and I'm thinking to myself, well, what could be another contributing factor to these rash of structural problems, metal fatigue, etc.? And then the thought hit me, well, it's our son. I am sure that our son is playing a major role in this, and here is why. 
cosmic rays. Now, I don't have anything to validate this. This is just sitting um, at uh, the airport for many hours, uh, meditating, pontificating, and just basically practicing what I do quite often, uh, daydreaming. Now, daydreaming is wonderful. But anyway, I digress. So cosmic rays, they hit us all the time. Uh, that is a fact, but it of late, and I say of late within this decade, they're increasing double digits. So we know that the earth is getting bombarded by increased cosmic rays. Now, they are not rays. Despite the name cosmic rays, they're not waves, but particles. Dr. Albers has shown us this. Also, many of them come from the sun rather than the cosmos. And that's another misconception. A lot of the cosmic rays are coming from the sun. I'm going to show you why. So cosmic rays are charged particles, such as protons, electrons, and the nuclei of heavy atoms, such as iron. They are highly energetic, with the fastest moving at the close speed of light. Now, that is flat hauling out. And let me just tell you something. When you think about moving nearly at the speed of light, if that ever gets stopped, well, there's typically going to be damage. So anyway, much of the Earth's cosmic rays comes from our sun. They emit out, and they go out into about 100 AU. Remember, 1 AU, figure roughly 100 million miles. I think technically it's 94, but it's easier that way. And it hits this uh, bow shock wave. It's called the solar wind termination shock wave. Now, as the solar winds, the Earth, let's just say, is here, we get hit the first time. As these particles go out, they are bounced back. They'll bounce out here in the heliosphere, and then they come back as anomalous cosmic rays. So the Earth gets dosed again. And then we have this interstellar, Neutral gas, which is also interstellar space, which is also where we get interstellar cosmic rays. So we get dosed pretty often, but because of our magnetosphere, the Earth remains virtually immune to this. Except now, with our magnetosphere collapsing, and with our sun at a minimum stage and going minimum further, in other words, less and less uh, output, the cosmic rays, the particles coming in, are increasing. And this is just a, a representation of how those rays react in the atmosphere, many times very high in the atmosphere. But as it continues to descend down in our atmosphere, there is this effect that is produced as electro electromagnetic showers. Now, this is a relatively new science that people, uh, scientists, are still looking into. A lot of papers have been written on this, but we're also seeing that it has more and more effect than what we realize. And then you have the Hadron Cascade, and that's another whole video for another subject. I wanted to bring this in because it shows the primary and secondary sources for cosmic radiation. You can see how the protons come in nearly at the speed of light. They hit the air molecules, and then you know there's reactions. There's the pistrons, the electrons, the muons, the neurons. And as the energy decreases, as it gets closer to the ground. But if you have an overall increase, remember, even being at the ground, we're going to suffer the effects. Now, when you're flying, you are higher in the atmosphere. And that's a problem. It's a problem for pilots. Uh, and the industry recognizes this as well. Uh, to bring this more into focus, if you fly commercially, uh, you typically are going to be in an aircraft that is about 25 to 35,000 feet. Now, you can see where the Concorde flew at 50,000 feet, and so you can get an idea of the type of effects and where they are and the intensity of the effects depending on where you are in the atmosphere. Obviously, the higher up, the worse the damage. Think about all those astronauts on the ISS. I don't know. Anyway, um, this kind of explains it down even further. 
Dr. Alberts will actually have her uh, get into this because I think she could probably really bring some insights into this. So again, just to give you an idea of what's actually happening. And as it hits the top of the atmosphere, the reactions begin to increase. The protons collide with the atmosphere molecules and things begin to happen. Now, I'm sitting there thinking, well, could this be a reason or a cause for the increase in micro stress fractures? Listen, every time a plane goes, takes off and lands, it's incredible stress being put on all the components. Uh, that's why many planes are now becoming more of uh, the exotic carbon uh, materials. But nevertheless, even those materials are subject to stresses. And I began to think about it, well, what if you had cosmic rays coming in and affecting the molecule structure of a plane? I mean, it happens. It happens just because of the laws of physics of what planes go through. But again, what if this was something that was an adding contributing factor? And what if this is just not metal fatigue? What if, in fact, there is a process here that is potentially weakening, altering other materials, like acrylics, uh, which most windows are uh, on airplanes are made out of? I mean, that's a bad day when you come sit in that seat. You've got to ask yourself, well, what the hell's going on there? And by the way, disintegration has incurred on planes. I know that doesn't happen in modern days, at least none that we know of, but in the beginning of when they were flying, yeah, there was actually this. So maybe that's why two aircraft had mechanical issues causing a five-hour delay. I could be completely wrong. And again, when you're not going anywhere, well, make the best time by, you know, exercising the mind. I could be wrong. Let me know. All you who f fly frequently, let me know what you think about this. Number one, and, and two, give me your comments on what do you think is really happening to our bodies that are subjected to these type of heavy particles? Well, that's a discussion. We'll talk soon.